Automated Podcast. Welcome to Automated. I'm your host, Mark Verbenkov, and in this weekly podcast, we will be exploring the impact of emerging technology on jobs, society, as well as us, with business and technology leaders, researchers, and independent professionals across the world. Okay, so in last week's episode, I really found that there was a clear emphasis on the need to take action to make autonomous vehicles a positive force in cities. And this uh, need to take action, I think, is something that has come up a few times in the podcast before in the discussions. So this is the kind of main theme that I wanted to focus on in today's episode. And uh, most notably, the idea that it's uh, not a determined fact that autonomous vehicles will benefit a city, but rather it depends on how they are implemented and used. So uh, the focus won't be on autonomous vehicles, but rather this need to take action, uh, the lack of kind of a deterministic uh, worldview when we're looking at different kinds of technologies. And more interestingly, kind of how, how the social interactions, uh, the kind of stakeholders with different kinds of uh, power influ- and influence, um, and how they are able to kind of influence how a technology is implemented and used. So I think that this is uh, really relevant, as I mentioned, it's been brought up in a couple of the ep- other episodes, but I haven't really taken the opportunity to look at this further. So this is what we'll be looking at today. And to do this, I'll be using one of my favorite historical stories of the lost nuclear thorium energy technology, which I really hope will make these ideas a little bit more clear for everybody. So the tech focused on isn't directly an automation technology, but I do hope that the story itself is provocative enough to make you kind of reconsider some of the podcast discussions if there was even a hint that there was kind of an inevitable path of a certain technology uh, and how it was going to be used. So overall, what I really hope is to demonstrate is that nuclear technology did not develop along a determined linear path, but was really rather strongly influenced by certain institutions, people, and of course, the different kind of mentalities that existed at the time. But perhaps you've never even heard of thorium. So let's start by looking at what it actually is. And I think the best way to do this is by simply contrasting the thorium reactors to those utilized across the planet today. So nuclear power plants across the globe use uranium as their main fuel. Although the technical details are well beyond the scope of this episode, the basic premise is that immensely pressurized water is used to cool solid uranium fuel contained within rods. So due to the strong radiation and pressures, the fuel rods themselves become physically worn, which requires their replacement after only around 5% of the energy of the uranium has been used. Now, what is both interesting and relevant for the uh, points that will come up later is that these spent rods contain one of the main elements needed to make nuclear weapons. This is plutonium-239, as well as many other radioactive elements, which we typically deem as nuclear waste. And this waste, of course, is both harmful to carbon-based life, and of course persists for thousands of years, which I think most of us are familiar with. However, unlike uranium, thorium is up to four times more abundant, and it actually doesn't require extensive and environmentally destructive mining practices to extract. Um, As it has different elemental properties from uranium, it does not require high pressurized water for cooling, which really enables the reduction of both the size and cost of a typical thorium power plant. And what's really interesting, I think, is that it makes an actual meltdown scenario practically impossible, making the thorium reactors uh, kind of inherently safe. It also cannot start a nuclear reaction. And because of this, a driver fuel like uranium catalyzes the reaction. But even after the fuel cycle is complete, the same uranium can be reused multiple times, thus producing up to two orders of magnitude less waste while increasing the efficiency of the fuel itself. However, the greatest benefits are that nuclear waste is extremely difficult to use in the weapon creation. And the half-life of the spent fuel is only a few hundred years in contrast with tens or hundreds of thousands of years with uranium. So given that thorium would be vastly preferred to our inefficient and heavily polluting uranium reactors with its efficient energy production capabilities, limited waste creation, and difficulty in proliferating weapons, 
why aren't all nuclear reactors based on thorium? The answer, of course, is found in how nuclear technology was framed in its early days. So up to 1948, there were attempts at global control of atomic weapons proliferation, as the U.S. was really the only country to possess nuclear technology. So up to this point, even many of the scientists from the Manhattan Project were promoting a simple and small upgrade of the current nuclear weapons and to focus nuclear research efforts in other areas like energy production while others were pushing for a superweapon, or hydrogen bomb, which would yield an explosive force many orders of magnitude greater than the weapons used on Japan. There were two primary groups holding opposite views of nuclear technology. The first was a group of scientists led by J. Robert Oppenheimer, who saw the development of a superweapon as technically improbable and overly expensive, while also realizing that the nuclear reactors would be used to generate weapons-grade materials. However, the supporters of the superweapon were led by another physicist, Edward Teller, while also finding supporters in the ranks of different senators, as well as the chairman of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. So due to the disarmament talks breaking down in 1948 and the Soviet military detonating its very first atomic weapon in 1949, everything really changed. The supporters of the superweapon program were able to use the fear-mongering with ideas like being overtaken by the Soviet Union to convince influential politicians and ultimately President Truman to accept and develop the hydrogen bomb. Governments, militaries, national media, and even the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission began to see nuclear reactors as machines that can churn out the ingredients necessary to produce nuclear weapons, with which to protect their nations from this new potential threat. So therefore, without this story being told, it would really appear that the scientific advancements simply led to the hydrogen bomb development and uranium reactors. But the reality is that with the acceptance of the superweapon development program, nuclear energy reactors were to be regarded as the weapon production plants first and energy production plants second. But where does thorium fit into this? So apart from bombs, propulsion for both ships and aircraft was also considered as interesting research paths. Most notably, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where research on nuclear aircraft propulsion was taking place, built a successful thorium test reactor in 1965 using different fuel systems than the typical uranium reactors. It actually operated for four and a half years and proved the many benefits described earlier of a thorium reactor compared to that of a uranium one. So Alvin Weinberg, he was the head of the Oak Ridge National Lab, and his team believed strongly that an efficient, safe, and proliferation-proof reactor could produce reliable energy based off of the tests that were done. However, the AEC and the U.S. military were very much still in favor of nuclear technology research and production focusing on plutonium-producing reactors. As such, they would only see the thorium reactor as a technology that was unable to produce the valuable plutonium needed for atomic weapon production. So even though Weinberg himself sent out constant proposals to make the current reactors safer by applying the Oak Ridge technology to them, his ideas did not fit the dominant narrative and would ultimately cost him his job as well as the project. So in 1969, after the successful test period, the reactor was shut down and the project was ultimately cancelled in 1972 by the AEC. This was really the final event that cemented one type of nuclear reactor as the dominant technology to continue forward in time, as there were no more stakeholders in positions of power to push for the thorium-based designs. So taking all of this into consideration, the thorium reactor's development was stopped due to social forces rather than technical limitations. In fact, viewing the nuclear industry with a contemporary lens, thorium reactors could actually be argued to be the technological determinist outcome of a society that has high energy requirements if the knowledge and the capability of building thorium reactors were to re-emerge. However, there is one final point that should secure the idea of how important a social context is to technological adoption. 
So once the Cold War subsided, nuclear technology was no longer predominantly seen as a weapon, but rather as a viable means for energy production. So this shift would have been really the perfect time to introduce thorium-based nuclear energy as a cleaner, safer, and more efficient alternative. However, in my point of view, this was sadly not to be the case. So the nuclear resistance movement began as soon as the world was introduced to nuclear power. As we all know, on August 6th, 1945, the city center of Hiroshima and roughly 100,000 of its inhabitants were to be erased from the face of the earth. This and other incidents, such as the poisoning of the Happy Dragon, a Japanese fishing ship caught in the fallout of a nuclear test, would add to the growing psychologically based aversion towards nuclear technology. So through the actions of spokesmen like Ralph Nader, Greenpeace, and even certain parts of the American media, ideas and sentiments changed to being against nuclear technology. The very first outright rejection of nuclear power came from residents in San Francisco against a proposed power plant on the San Andreas fault line in the 1960s. Although this allowed a case from which to base future protests against local power plant projects, it was really Ralph Nader, who as a champion of consumer interest, gave a national voice against all nuclear technology due to the associated health risks. So due to the success of protests against uh, the Vietnam War, for instance, activists attaching themselves to the anti-nuclear agenda were able to use legal means to slow and even cripple many construction efforts based on the rhetoric of the imposed risk that nuclear technology had on consumers. So all of these different groups culminated in, of course, the 1979 Three Mile Island incident where a really manageable issue in a nuclear reactor was reported by the media as being a near catastrophic meltdown, which really added to the boiling emotional resentment towards the nuclear program. The effect of this was that from 1975 onwards, no new nuclear stations were to be built in the U.S., and any dream of implementing thorium reactors were quickly dispelled. So therefore we can see that thorium reactors were pushed out from really two different angles, both their inability to support the needed nuclear weapon production paradigm, as well as the total societal rejection of nuclear technology by the civilian population. So with this in mind, I really hope that it has become clear that different groups holding contrary ideas about what nuclear technology means use their power and influence to make their idea a reality. In every case, thorium-based nuclear power lost as a dominant concept and was really removed from history's story. We saw how the Cold War stakeholders like the AEC framed nuclear technology and specifically nuclear power plants as plutonium producers with just a very basic side effect of producing energy. This idea was finalized when President Truman went forward with the development of the hydrogen bomb superweapon. With this dominant social frame in play, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and their successful thorium reactor program closed down in favor of energy reactors with incredibly inefficient energy production. We also saw how the anti-nuclear movement created a fervor around keeping nuclear reactors and research at bay, which kept the thorium reactors offline for subsequent decades, even when the opportunity to change away from the old uranium nuclear plants was opened up. So once again, the goal of this specific episode was to elaborate on the idea that technological development and adoption is not entirely deterministic. Multiple social forces play an enormous role in which technologies will be the ones to be used in the future. So hopefully these ideas should be relevant for the future conversations this podcast will engage in, as well as preferably give you, the audience, an idea that your own agency is important in how our technological future is actually realized. Well, that's it for this week's episode. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast and the conversations here, the best way to do this is to go onto Apple Podcasts and leave a review as it helps the algorithm to reach out to new listeners and brings the show to them. Also, feel free to check out the website, automatedpodcast.org, where you can find the show notes for each episode, written articles on the themes of the podcast, and a library of resources on the topic of emerging tech and automation. 
Also, if you want to reach out and leave any feedback or you have any questions about the podcast or any of the conversations, there are general contact links such as email, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. for you there on the website. And finally, for those of you that want more than just an audio conversation, the video recordings are now going to be up on YouTube for the newer conversations. So feel free to check out the videos by searching for Automated Podcast on YouTube, where, of course, you can like and subscribe if you prefer to support the podcast that way. The Automated Podcast.